Good afternoon. We are in the second day of notes for chapter five functions, and we're going to go through a series of steps where you analyze graphs using different criteria. So the first one is types of extrema. You might want to pause the video and take a second to draw this graph um, and label the points that um, I'm labeling here because they're going to be used in our analysis. Okay, so this is our example function. So number one, we're going to look for what we call local maximums. Local maximums are kind of like hills. We're looking for maximums at different spots. Now we have one little hill here, and when you write your local maximums, uh, it's the maximum is of, you do the y value first, so y equals zero at x equals zero. And then you always say at the location. So the maximum is the y value. And then it's at the x value, which is the location of that particular maximum. Okay, number two, local minimum. There can be more than one. So local minimum um, is a minimum that occurs uh, in the graph for the y values. And local minimums, if you're given the choice between local minimum and absolute minimum, then you're going to separate them out. If all they want is local minimums and local maximums, you'll include the absolute minimum in with the local minimums. So this minimum is here. So it's of, and then you give the y value, y equals negative 1, and it occurs at x equals 2. No matter what your book says, I want you to write it that way every time. So those are locals. Now we're going to do absolute maximum, which is the tallest point of the graph. Now this graph keeps going. It never stops. So there actually are none from absolute maximum. There's no absolute maximum. It's unbounded on the top. So um, bounded on the bottom only. And then the last one, number four, the absolute minimum. Absolute minimum means the absolute lowest value on the graph, which is this one. And that would be an absolute minimum of y equals negative 5 at x equals negative 2. So always use that format when finding it. Okay, Roman numeral 2. This is increasing and decreasing behavior. Sometimes they'll say graph behavior, sometimes they'll say intervals, um, but it is the increasing, decreasing behavior of the graph. Okay, so there's three types of things that can happen in an increasing or a decreasing graph. Um, number one, you can have increasing intervals, and there can be more than one. And that's where your, as your x gets larger, your f of x or your y gets larger. In other words, it has a positive slope. So that's increasing. The second one is decreasing interval or intervals. As x gets larger, f of x is getting smaller. That has a negative slope to it. And then the third type of increasing, decreasing behavior that you don't see very often is what we call a constant interval or intervals. And this is where, as x gets larger, f of x stays the same. That's a constant interval. So when they're asking for increasing or decreasing behavior, what they're looking for are intervals. Intervals are always x values. So we're looking for x values. And we're going to draw a little sample graph down here. Doesn't have to be very large. Um, drawing myself a little pair of axes, and this graph, we'll put it there, one, two, three, we'll put it there, 
two and three. It comes up, it is flat, and then it keeps going. So using this example to describe increasing or decreasing, our increasing interval is from negative infinity. Remember, these are, we're looking for x values, negative infinity, and then it stops at two. So your increasing interval is negative infinity up to two inclusive. Uh, from here it gets flat, so your constant interval is between 2 and 3. And your this interval here is also increasing. It's not decreasing. It's continuing to go upward. So we would put a union symbol with this. In union with, it starts at 3 and goes to the right. So 3 up to positive infinity. And once again, just to remind you, in, anytime they're talking an interval, they're talking x values. Okay, so we did that using this little example at the bottom. Let's use our big example at the top, and we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to switch colors of ink so it's really clear which one goes with which one. Okay, I'm just going to put like a diamond to separate these out. I'm going to look at that one for the second set. Okay, so we're looking for increasing. So my increasing interval, this is going upward from here to here, so that's negative 2 to 0, negative 2 up to 0, and then it decreases, and then here's this other increasing interval, is from 2 up to positive infinity. So in union with 2 up to positive infinity. That's increasing. Okay, so now we're going to do decreasing. This interval is decreasing, negative infinity up to x equals negative 2. So negative infinity up to negative 2, bracket. And then this interval here is also decreasing from 0 to 2. So in union with 0 to 2. And we're giving only the x values where this is happening. Now in the case of the upper graph, constant intervals, there are none. Um, just like on this, this graph here, decreasing intervals, there were none. So that's how you describe increasing or decreasing behavior. Okay, Roman numeral three. Graph symmetry. And your choices for graph symmetry, let me get this focused in, your choices for graph symmetry are even, odd, or meter. Now even though the word symmetry seems to indicate that it's going to be a visual thing, it actually isn't. Um, it's an algebraic description. So part A, algebraic description. So you have to determine it using algebra. Okay, so the rule for even symmetry, so this is number one, the rule for even symmetry is that f of negative x is equal to f of x. In other words, you replace x with negative x, simplify, and you get what you started with. So an example of even symmetry is f of x equals 3x to the fourth. So what you have to do is you have to run a test and this is your test. So I'm going to find f of negative x. So I replace the x with negative x. Use your parentheses wisely to the fourth. And what happens is when you raise a negative to an even power, it ends up being positive. So 3x to the fourth. This is just like the original function. So therefore, the function is even. Okay, number two. Odd symmetry. Odd symmetry says that f of negative x is equal to negative 1 times the original function. That's your rule. So we're going to do an example of a function with odd symmetry. 
f of x equals 3x cubed. Okay, so your test. First thing you do is you want to find f of negative x. So f of negative x is 3 times negative x cubed. And that simplifies the negative times a negative times a negative is a negative. So I get a negative 3x cubed. Now this, the odd symmetry always has two parts to the test. This part, and then you have to do the negative 1 times f of x part. You have to do both halves and then compare them. So this would be negative 1 times 3x cubed, which is a negative 3x cubed. So those two were equal to each other. Therefore, the function is odd. Now, even odd neither. There's one more category. You can have a function that is both, but it's very, very rare. Typically, we test for even symmetry because that gives us our f of negative x, and then we just use it to test for the odd. And it could be neither. Neither one could work out. Okay, that's algebraic. You determine even and odd status using algebra. Now, you can do some graphical support. But again, it is, it is only support. It is not the definitive word on what type of function it is. So you only use this as a help. Okay, so we're going to draw an even graph. We're going to draw an odd graph. So draw yourself a small pair of axes. Okay. So an even function would be something like a really flat looking parabola. So in an even function, it actually looks what we would call even. You can fold it in half and it, it looks like the left equals the right. Uh, this actually is the function y equals 3x to the fourth. That's what it looks like. That's what even looks like. You can, you can fold it. Um, another way to think of it is every point is equidistant to the line of symmetry. Okay, so for odd, here's an example of an odd graph. This is actually y equals 3x cubed. So for an odd graph, you want to flip it and decide if it looks the same. So you actually turn the graph upside down and see if it looks the same. If it does, you have an odd graph. Notice it kind of has to come through the center. If the S occurs anywhere else, it won't flip and look the same. All right, Roman number four. Uh, we're gonna do zeros, asymptotes, and end behavior. Zeros, asymptotes, and end behavior. Okay, so let's start with A. We're going to do zeros. All right, the zeros of a function are the x-intercepts. We also call them roots. So basically to find a zero, uh, the, there's going to be an x value a and then a zero for the y value. All right, so what you do is you set the top of the function equal to zero and solve. Okay, we're going to do an example. Let's say that y equals 3x plus 2 over x squared minus 1. So what you're going to do is replace y with zero. which then when you multiply this out on both sides, it disappears, which is why you just set the top equal to zero. And then I'm just going to put dot, dot, dot. You solve it and you end up with x equals negative two-thirds. So if you're describing it as a zero, you describe it as x equals negative two-thirds. If you describe it as an x-intercept, then you need to do two, negative two-thirds comma zero. Um, roots, it depends on what they're asking for. Okay, that's zeros. Okay, B. Vertical asymptotes. 
and graph holes. Vertical asymptotes and graph holes. Okay, so basically what are they? Um, vertical asymptotes are x values not in the domain. They're gaps in the domain. And the way you find it is you set the bottom of the fraction equal to zero and solve. And we're going to do that in a second. Actually, let's just do it now. Okay, so we're going to take the, the same function here. And we want to find out what x values are not in the domain. So we take the bottom, which is x squared minus 1, set it equal at, to 0, and solve it. So add the 1 over, you get x squared equals 1. Square root both sides, you get x equals 1 and x equals negative 1. And those are your asymptotes. And I'm going to put a square around the answers here. Okay, so this graph has no holes, but let's talk about holes. Um, you get a hole in the graph if a top factor cancels a bottom factor. So here's an example of that. Let's say you're trying to analyze the graph f of x equals x times x minus 1 over x minus 1 times x plus 1. Now, because the x minus 1's match, they cancel out, but you need to set x minus 1 equal to 0, and you get x equals 1 as the whole. And we're going to do an example of that where you can actually see a hole, but you know it's basically just a, a gap in the graph, you know, a little hole like that in the graph. Okay, vertical asymptotes and holes. Part C, horizontal asymptotes and end behavior. Horizontal, and I'm going to put and slant asymptotes. And they basically are the end behavior. So they're going to ask you to list the asymptotes and describe the end behavior. Okay, here are the rules. Let's say y equals x to the power of m over x to the power of n. And this is multiplied out. Here are the rules. Uh, first one. If m equals n, then you're going to take y equals the first term over the first term and simplify. The result is going to be y equals a number. All right, that's rule number one. Okay, rule number two. If m is less than n. All right, if the top power is less than the bottom power, it is automatically a y equals zero asymptote or end behavior. Okay, the third situation, if m is greater than n, you have what's called a slant asymptote. So it's a line with a slant in it. Sometimes it's a curve. So what you're going to do is take y equals x to the m over x to the n and simplify. So you'll probably get like y equals some number ax. Sometimes you can get a parabola as your slant asymptote. It just, be, it just depends. So remember x to the m and x to the n it's the first term on the top over the first term on the bottom. And pretty much you just have to memorize these three rules. There isn't really a, another logical way to remember them. 
All right, let's do a practice. Okay, here's our function. f of x equals 3x plus 2 over x squared minus 1. Okay, and we're going to find the graphing behavior and make the graph. So we have what's called a laundry list. Um, whenever we do these, I want all of your analysis stuff on the right-hand side and then your graph on the left. So we're going to go through it. Zeros, x-intercept, y-intercept, um, vertical asymptotes, horizontal asymptotes, and any graph holes that you might have. Okay, so for zeros, you take the top and set it equal to zero. So for zeros, we take 3x plus 2 equal to zero and solve, and we get x equals negative 2 thirds. Okay, so our zero is x equals negative 2 thirds, which means we have a intercept at negative 2 thirds, which is right about there. negative two-thirds comma zero. So that's your x-intercept, negative two-thirds comma zero. Okay, y-intercept, you do it just like you would anything else. You set x equal to zero and solve. So y equals three times zero plus two over zero minus one, which equals negative two. So zero, negative two is my y-intercept. There it is. Okay, vertical asymptotes. You're going to set the bottom equal to zero and solve. So x squared minus one equal to zero, and you end up with x equals one and x equals negative one. Naturally, I'm, I'm sorry I kind of tried to squeeze this stuff in there. Usually you want to do all your scritchy work down below and just put your answers up here because I have to find them. So this is not probably the best example of how to make your work readable. Sorry about that. All right, let's draw the asymptote. So we've got one at negative one. When you draw an asymptote, you label it and put a box around it, x equals negative one. Also, it gets arrows and it is dashed. The other one is x equals positive one. Label it at either end, put it in a box, x equals one. Okay, horizontal asymptote. The power of the top is less than the power of the bottom. So m is less than n, therefore we know y equals zero is your horizontal asymptote. So you offset it just slightly so you can see your line. Again, it gets arrowheads, label it at one end, y equals zero, put a box around it. Okay, holes. If I were to factor the bottom, that would be x plus 1, x minus 1. There are no shared factors, so in this case, there are none. There are no holes in the graph. All right, so after you've done the laundry list, now you need to actually calculate points. And you can do that any way you want, um, but you want to make sure that you go around these things. Now, one thing you want to know is, Anytime you have a horizontal asymptote at zero, it tends to get crossed towards the middle. It doesn't always, but it tends to. But your x-intercepts are absolute. The line will not cross anywhere except for where you have an intercept marked. So I can already tell that this is a line that kind of is an S-shape and comes down, and it never goes through the asymptotes. The other rule is you can't have a graph over itself. So I'm either going to have graph here or graph here, graph here or graph here. Graph is never over itself. I just have to figure out where is the graph. So this is where you're going to pick a point, like x equals 2, and figure out where the heck that graph is. So y equals, and I'm going to use factored form. I think it's faster to calculate in factored form. So 6 plus 2 is 8 over 2 plus 1 is 3, 2 minus 1 is 1. See how fast that is? It's great. 8 thirds. So 2 and 2 thirds. So 2 to the right and then up 1, 2 and 2 thirds. We label the point. And that's all you need for a curve is one good point that tells you that your S 
or your curvy shape comes down, it kind of skims the corner. And there's nothing here because you know you have a value there. Okay, so I also need one over here. I'm going to do x equals negative 2. Again, I'm going to use factored form. It's faster. Negative 6 plus 2 is negative 4. Negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1. Negative 2 minus 1 is negative 3. And that equals negative 4 thirds. So I'm going to go 1, 2 to the left, and then 1 and a third down. So this point is negative 2 negative four-thirds. We label it. Notice it's closer in than that one. These are not like symmetrical graphs where things are the same. It just changes depending on where you are at. So this is going to come up, a little sharper bend, and get infinitely close but not cross the asymptote. Again, if you have graph here, you won't have graph there. Um, your check of your graph, of course, is to run it through a grapher and see if you got it right. Depending on the type of grapher you have, when you input, you can either use factored form or regular form. So y equals, let me clear that garbage out. This is an older calculator, not fancy, so the top and the bottom get their own parentheses. So parentheses 3x plus 2, close it, divided by left parentheses, now the bottom. I'm going to go x squared minus 1, close. Now notice it says plot. 1 is highlighted. i got to turn that off or it's going to mess with my graph. So I'm going to go into stat plot. Plot 1 is turned on. I'm going to turn it off and then go back to that. Um, window, uh, probably tens, negative 10 to 10, negative 10 to 10. Going by ones is a good starting point. All right, let's trace it out and see what we've got. This will tell you what your graph is supposed to look like. Now, danger, danger, danger. If your graph has graph holes, it will not show you that. Your grapher will lie to you. That's why you have to find the grapher holes algebraically. Let me show you an example of that. So this one, our graph does look good. If you want to check individual values in the trace menu, input a 2, push enter. It says 2.66 repeat, so that's right. I can put in a negative 2, enter, and it'll say negative 1.3, which is negative 4 thirds. So you can also check your points using your grapher, which is a really, really handy function. Okay, so let me put in the different function. Back on, under B, vertical asymptotes, uh, we inputted the equation x times x minus 1. If it's factored, you can still input it in factored form. You just have to use more parentheses. So top parentheses, x, now left parentheses, x minus 1, close the x minus 1, close the top of the fraction. See how the parentheses are around the top? Divided by left parentheses to open the bottom. Then I'm going to do x minus 1, so another left, x minus 1, right. And then another left, x plus 1, close, close. The last one goes with the first one and delineates the bottom of the equation. All right, so let's trace this out and see what we get. Now notice how it looks all nice and smooth and continuous. Got lots of points all over the place. But if I input a 1, actually let's start with the asymptote. You have an asymptote at negative 1. If I input a negative 1 for the asymptote, it won't give me a y value. See how the y is blank? That's because there's no y value on the asymptote. It's an asymptote. There's nothing on it. The graph hole will behave the same way. If you input a positive one, it's blank. But look at the graph. There's no hole at positive one. Why? Your grapher lies to you. So you, as the algebra student, have to know the difference between an asymptote and a hole. You also need to know where the hole is algebraically before you can check it with a graph. So I wanted to really quick show you that because your grapher is a great way to check these problems. All right, that is all for today. Have a good afternoon.